So hello everyone, welcome to Next Big Future. And we have, uh, I'm very happy to have my great guest here, Robin Hansen, um, who's uh, uh, famous as a, as a futurist, has had many uh, great debates on things. He has um, a Substack, uh, discussing overcoming bias. And we both have been talking about the uh, population crisis. And uh, so we'll just discuss what we both think about that as well as what can be done impacts to things. I have a um, some areas of topics that we can discuss. Uh, what has already happened? Because I think that um, things have already shown themselves to be really massively impacting and potentially could cause a major global financial and you know, regional uh, financial problems uh, from now to 2050. Definitely a um, at least a major headwind to economic growth. Um, certain things in that area are, you know, there are a number of fertile women, um, working age populations, spending curves as we age. So if for Japan, one of the leading countries that's been hitting this, it was their economic, economy hitting the wall and declining is the number of people, the number of working age people, as well as how old they are and how many seniors there are. So this affects many things and we can discuss that because Robin is also an economist. And then we can discuss real estate supply and demand in Japan and what that means for China with their economic dependency and then current population pyramids, um, innovation impacts, as well as the long-term aspects of extinction or, or massive population decline. Um, Robin had a article, oh, I have this thing about, um, also, that uh, in the Inception movie, you had Saito, the Japanese character, telling, um, uh, asking Hob, the, the main character, if you want to become an old man, fill regret waiting to die alone. Because that's another sociological impact is that many people in Japan are dying alone, and that will increase. As a, so it's just, there's emotional, family, and other sociological impacts of this stuff without, beyond the economy and the childlessness, um, we can discuss that. So uh, overcoming bias. So you had uh, 13 fertility scenarios. 16, actually. 16, <laughs> I okay. I had it, okay. Uh, extinction, poverty, big war. So before we go into all that, so how did you want to discuss like where we are um, and, and what your feelings are? So I am more of a theorist and I'm more of the sort of person who really <laughs> likes to focus. So. There are other people in the world, like say biologists or doctors, who they can just manage a huge world of detail and they do a good job of it. And I'm not one of those people. So my usual intellectual mm -hmm. strategy is to try to focus and say, what's the most important thing to think about? Mm -hmm. And in this case, I, I, I realized that I had been going too focused. And so I tried to at least expand and consider a wider risk of scenarios. And I hadn't seen other people do that. It's just enumerate. What are all the possibilities here? Right. So right. we had that in view. But my, my goal in doing that was then to focus again, <laughs> right. just so that I could not be overwhelmed by all the possibilities. So mm -hmm. I would, you know, you know, so there's lots of things we could talk about here, but I, I think we should, um, like, well, first of all, bring our, our visual up to the camera. So we're looking at ourselves rather than the slide. Okay. Okay. Um, but, you know, to me as a futurist, the, the big thing here is that this is an obstacle to all the other future visions I've ever heard of. Right. And the, so that that's really a big deal. That is, there's a lot of things that happen in the world. You go, oh, that's a temporary problem, a modest problem. We'll get past it. I'm looking at the big picture. Right, right. But when you've got a problem that will like displace the big picture. Right. Now that's a big problem. So right. this seems to be of that character, which I hadn't quite realized as mm. much as, as I've come to realize recently. Mm. Uh, and the key issue here is that most of the things we hope will happen in the long run in the future derive from innovation. <laughs> right. And in fact, once population starts declining, innovation comes to a halt. <laughs> That's right. the thing I hadn't realized. And so right. all these other things you were hoping for, they get put on hold <laughs> right. until population rises again to its previous level or the economy at least rises to its previous level. And right. in that intermediate time, all the things you were hoping will happen with innovation, they don't happen. Right, right. That's what makes this a really big deal, <laughs> mm -hmm. because innovation is really the main source of most of the stuff we're hoping for coming along in the future. 
And so mm -hmm. we usually argue about which things will happen first, assuming that there's a whole bunch of different tracks of innovation leading to all sorts of different possibilities. And then we're not sure which future to focus on because who knows which things will happen first, but there's going to be this period <laughs> where nothing happens. Right, <laughs> None right, of right. it. Right, and right, then right. things can go really wrong during that period. Like, so that's the big worry here. There's going to come this period where innovation ends and we yeah. face a whole bunch of obstacles during that time. And then we only can deal with those obstacles using whatever innovations we had at the beginning of that period. Mm -hmm. And we may, <laughs> you know, that seems to be important. And the other way this gets interesting is just if you ask, well, what could reverse this fertility decline? Yeah. Pretty much all the scenarios are substantially different or weird. <laughs> that is, right. there isn't a mainstream scenario by which this gets solved. Right. All of the scenarios are, change the world in pretty big ways such that your analysis of the future needs to know about those. Right. So that right. makes it a very pivotal event. Right. Oh, right. you know, which of these scenarios, I, the 16 I listed, is the one that actually is the thing that reverses fertility if something does, it makes mm -hmm. a huge difference which one of those it is. And okay. that makes it really interesting to me. So that's why I'm becoming more motivated and interested in this topic. I realize mm -hmm. I've been assuming a continued growth and innovation, which has been the trend for a million years. It's right, not right. such a crazy thing to assume. Right. Uh, but we've got this good evidence that mm, there's going to be a, maybe a couple centuries where that's halted, where we don't mm -hmm. have innovation. And then mm -hmm. we face a bunch of pretty big obstacles as population declines during that period. And then whatever mm -hmm. happens afterwards is shaped a lot by which of those routes we take out of that problem. Right. So, so this is something that um, I've done uh, fairly deep dives on uh, in terms of the um, uh, the details of how bad this problem is. Yet, I agree with you as a futurist about you know how down the road and and also fairly rapidly this could really screw things up for all the future scenarios. Innovation, I agree on that. One thing about it that um, some people will take the uh, the UN projections of population and say that, okay, well, I don't have to be that worried. It, the population will peak at, you know, some point later in the 2000, maybe before 2100. And then, um, then things start declining. And and then they have a population projection for China, um, like uh, the world population projection for China was like to 1.1 uh, 1 billion in the medium scenario, but then they dropped it to 700 million, um, you know, in the more recent thing. So a substantial shift in that number for 2100. But the digging into that projection, they are assuming that China get in the medium, China gets back to 1.48 uh, fertility rate. The most recent 2022 number is that China has 1.09, and they've been at 1.1 roughly for the right. past three or four years. So the assumption that you get back to 1.8, 1.48, is not a good assumption. Right? I, I agree. So yeah. I, I mean, we can certainly complain about the UN and other sources all through history having yeah. you know neglected the problem because they estimated this would be fertility would be higher and it would the decline would halt, but uh, let's just assume it's declining and it will continue declining. Right, the right, question, right. The, still the question is, well, you know, there's the question of how bad, how fast it gets. Right. But that seems less interesting to me than like, how do we get out of this? Like, what okay. will be the way out? Because, okay. you know, okay. though some people might even say it'll never. So, for example, I was just talking with my colleague, Brian Kaplan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have Africa fertility falling. Yeah. Uh, on the same historical tre trend, but he was saying, oh, well, maybe Africa will never get down below re replacement. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, they will save world population because they will just keep growing up. That seems unlikely to me, but, yeah. you know, that's in some sense, one of the scenarios you could think about, like right. which region might save it by not going below replacement. But it really looks to me like they're all going to go below replacement. Mm -hmm. And that's because people are becoming more integrated to a world culture that, you know, values all the things that are, an obstacle of fertility. Yeah, so uh, a couple of sentences before we move on to the how we solve it. The how quick, how fast thing, like the Africa scenario is, they're talking about 4% of the world GDP in Africa. And then if it hits to 90% of your economy for many decades of being trashed, the world economy goes to total crap. So 
So, and then India and Bangladesh are below replacement. So it can't be just um, the only developed countries. It's basically hit them. And then for, for we don't skip, we skip over, but the whole trend of education, um, uh, um, lack of um, 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 baby mortality, you know, th those, all those things, as you get any kind of modest amount of non-extreme poverty, you then transition into this um, low, you know, below right. placement thing. Um, and then only a few countries, which I can, you know, Pakistan, Israel, you know, who are the exceptions, and we can discuss that exception later uh, in, in, in part of that, one of these scenarios. So in terms of getting out of it, so um, the countries, uh, European, Asian, that have tried the pro-natal policies, spending a few billion dollars, trying to pay people, tax policy, those kind of things. Um, most successful probably being Sweden, um, which went from, I think, 1.4, um, 1.5, up to 1.8, 1.9. So that is, you know, an improvement. And then the lack of sustainability, because it kind of goes up, and then you brought some right. babies forward, and then it kind of goes away. But not above 2.1. And I'll uh, briefly uh, tell people about the importance of 2.1 total fertility rate. That is the total number of children a, a woman will have over her lifetime. And the 2.1 matters because if you, on average, say half boys, half girls, the mother is trying to replace herself with a fertile daughter. That that goes to the 2.1, the, the 0.1 right. being uh, rounding errors. So, yeah. Right. So again, I... I think the most interest. I mean, I think we maybe other people would disagree with us, but you and I don't need to spend much time arguing with them because they're not here. Right. We disagree. This is a big problem and it's happening fast and it's, you know, something we need to be thinking about now. Yeah. But again, I think the most interesting question then is, well, how will we ever get out of this? Yeah. Uh, and I recently, a few hours ago, I completed some polls yeah. where I asked on Twitter, I had these 16 scenarios. And for mm -hmm. those ones, I basically did polls where I asked people to pick, you know, I gave them four of them and asked them to pick which one was the most of three different parameters. Mm -hmm. And that then I could use that to fit a model to, to uh, score them in terms of high versus low. And so mm -hmm. the three parameters are how likely is each scenario, mm -hmm. how much do we desire each scenario, and then how good of a story does each scenario make. Mm -hmm. And so we could start by taking their most likely scenarios and going down the list and talking about um, you know, what do we think those are likely and how bad do we think they are? Because that, that mm -hmm. gives us an organizing principle here. You right. know, we may not agree with their likelihood, but you could say so. But at least this, you know, using this large consensus of, you know, 2,400 <laughs> responses right. to talk about which were it. So um, the most likely scenario people said here, even mm -hmm. though you can see the next column, it isn't exactly their most desired scenario, <laughs> mm -hmm. is a insular subculture. Mm -hmm. So as we know, there is like Mormons or Orthodox Jews or the Amish, where mm -hmm. they have higher fertility and they are somewhat insular. But it seems so far, those none mm -hmm. of those cultures are sufficiently fertile and insular to actually have a net positive fertility effect on, on the world. Right. Um, but another one could arise. So yeah. we could, those could vary. They, they could become more fertile and more insular or new ones could arise. Mm -hmm. And that's the most likely scenario, mm -hmm. <laughs> according to these votes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what do you think? Does that seem likely to you or are they, is this overrated here? <clears throat> the, the problem is that the um, into the cultures, the um, Hasidic Jews, um, extreme uh, Muslims, uh, you know, are, you know, people with those kind of religion, um, Amish, have higher fertility rates, but um, they are currently are such a small number that that um, rebound effect doesn't Seem to take well, then effect. it takes many centuries take to many play centuries. out. But th that's what we're facing here is that this whole thing may take many centuries. So we're maybe searching for what scenario will happen first. And you might mm -hmm. think if something else happened first, then that happens because this takes a while. But if nothing else happens first, then this happens yeah. eventually, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but even those subcultures at the moment, like, don't have sufficient insularity. That is, they yeah. may have five kids per family, but maybe less than two of them stay in that subculture. Right. So what the, you know, the relevant number for the subculture is the number of their kids times the percentage of them that stay in the subculture. Right. So, so for me, my um, favorite scenarios and thing that I can think of most impact fastest 
is uh, frozen eggs, a uh, national subsidy, and um, s some uh, blending of um, uh, wealth and old moms. So let's uh, let's go through the one by one. Sure. Uh, so the highest one on the list. So the second one on the list. I guess we should just talk about it because the second on the list because national subsidy is number three. Mm -hmm. the second one is DNA selection. Right. That is, we do believe that eventually. Right. Uh, there'll be sufficient DNA selection for high fertility. Right. Um, and in my post, I suggested that it might be at the cost of social cooperativeness or something. <laughs> that mm -hmm. is, the, it, the main effect seems to be that people want to be high status and, you know, to, to be respected by other people in the world. And that's why they're not having fertility. So the mm -hmm. high fertility DNA would presumably be DNA about personality types that really like fertility and don't care so much what other people think of them. <laughs> right. And perhaps I made the analogy to dark triad. So mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, undesirable in the sense of the kind of people selected for maybe aren't the kind of people we like so much. Mm -hmm. But uh, the more important, you know, other question is, is how long would that take? So we've seen right. 250 years of selection and it hasn't happened right. yet. Right. So right. it's not clear how many more centuries it would take, mm -hmm. although it's not clear how many more centuries it will take to get the insular subcultures up either. Right, uh, right. But so these are both things that we expect will happen eventually and probably before, say, the you know thousand year deadline. <laughs> right, right, right. Of ex human extinction. Right. But uh, neither of them are especially attractive scenarios, but they are the things that it would happen eventually if something else doesn't. Right. And now right. The, the third one is national subsidy. Mm -hmm. So that's something that obviously could happen faster mm -hmm. if some nations would do it. Mm -hmm. And then the things to notice is first, as you were saying, you're going to need some pretty large subsidies. <laughs> Right. Modest ones tried really aren't sufficient. You're going to be pretty large. So, and that means pretty large taxes too. Right, right. So um, Japan has declared, the you know, prime minister has declared it um, a um, you know, national emergency. Um, they're going to spend uh, tens of billions of dollars, um, you know, $30 billion, um, you know, I think per year or something like that um, upon this um, um, efforts, the various efforts to subsidize and to get more people. My view on that is that um, if these projections of like, you know, say China dropping to from 1.4 billion to, to uh, 1.1 billion by 2050, so losing U U.S. population uh, levels by in, in less than 30 years and Japan going from 122 million to less than 100 million 2050, so 22 million people, those levels of losses are... Um, worse than any war that they've uh, either country has had experienced where you've lost that many people and china lost a lot of people in world war ii um but you know still only 10 percent. so if you're going to lose that many people lose that much workforce then you should prioritize it at your military spending or higher and that you should be devoting uh people and resources uh to, okay. to the level of threat but there's a big difference between would and should <laughs> Wouldn't you? Right. right. So in the past, actually, nations don't usually act very strategically to promote their national futures. Right. <laughs> Mostly, mm -hmm. you know, national governments do respond to say their publics and what interests they push on them. Mm -hmm. And that often is at odds with the long term future of the country. And people are much more willing to fight an enemy who who hurts them than just their own bad choices. <laughs> Right. And so right. even individuals we know often make just bad life choices and then they stick with them. But if mm -hmm. somebody were to force those choices on them, they would be really irate and fighting it. But if right, they right. just choose it themselves, they they accept. So I it's not obvious that very many nations would do this, but there's a lot of nations in the world. So right. I'm more thinking that maybe a couple would. Right. And that's more the hope for the scenario is it not that it would be a typical choice, but that right. you know, out of 150 nations maybe five, right. start to do this. Right. Um, China is um, making um, the egg freezing and the uh, mutual fertilization free in, in many uh, cities and provinces. So they've already started to do that. So they've gone to a higher level, um, a more serious national subsidy, um, you know, and looking at other policies. Uh, Denmark has about 10% uh, of their births from uh, in vitro fertilization, have had that for a while. So uh, we're going beyond just um, here, have some money, have a kid. Um, and there's um, some nuances of that where um, 
there's a step which has not been taken yet to um, to say one, we will make it mandatory or nearly mandatory that the young women must freeze their eggs by the time they're 22. The, if you free the young egg, you right. can maintain viability so at 20%. I can imagine that. So, so now we're at the frozen egg scenario, which is right. on my list of likelihood. And so my, these likelihood has numbers, I will just say. Yeah. You know, insular subculture is 100, DNA selection is 71, national subsidy mm -hmm. is 70, a big war that makes people poor is 60, and then frozen eggs is 57 here. Yeah. Um, the, the, the big issue I would think is, that, I mean, I think we, we will be able to make frozen eggs more cheap and reliable. The yeah. big question is, when you freeze your eggs and then you choose to have children later in life, you just have a lot less energy and stamina, and then you are, you know, have invested in a career. So the key question is really how many people will be willing Mm -hmm. to put how much energy into having kids, even with frozen eggs. It's, it's not obvious here that this actually works overall to raise mm -hmm. fertility above replacement. So um, some statistical uh, things uh, to give us an approximation of that is that um, the involuntarily childless, where they, you know, they thought, okay, I, I, I get my education, I have my career, and then I have kids. And they, they, they misestimate the fertility in right. their thirties or forties, they thought oh, I can I can do it till whatever, and then they end up childless because, oops, I'm not fertile, right? right. I tried whatever and I'm not fertile, so that is between four to ten percent, depending upon where you're looking, right? Okay. So if the childless couples are currently ten to twenty percent, right. and then you're but, heading you know, okay, but a four to ten percent boost in fertility doesn't you move most places above for replacement. True. Right. It, it, it's helpful, but it's not going to buy itself enough. Right. Right. But it, it does um, slow down and hope and, and give you more effect to possibly other things work. And then if you push it hard right. enough, if you push it hard enough, then, you know, OK, just the involuntarily fertile. And then I combine so that. One thing we could consider is multiple of these things combined together to produce something that none of them could buy themselves. Right. right, 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 and we should keep that in mind. But it is simpler to analyze them one by one. Sure. So let's go back to the national subsidy. Yeah. I mean, the, the key idea would be well. So first of all, we should know it's going to be a large subsidy, not a small one. Right. <laughs> okay. And secondly, if, if there's a future where some nations are successfully subsidizing and others are not, there'll be a tempt temptation for the second set of nations to just <laughs> grab the young adults from the subsidizing nations and then entice them to immigrate. Right. And so these nation, these nations who are subsidizing it, you know, they will have paid all this money to make these children grow up, and then other people are grabbing the benefits, and they might mm -hmm. resent that, and so they might create emigration taxes, mm -hmm. and right. that goes against a lot of world culture at the moment. So the world culture we really disapprove of, say, North Korea or the mm -hmm. old Soviet Union when they wouldn't let people leave, mm -hmm. but now we, you know, have to accept at least a few nations that not only have high subsidies but also high taxes for leaving. For one aspect of the national subsidy, like you don't think that when, like Japan's looking at um, uh, killing or you know greatly cutting back their uh, national pension and other programs, because basically as you fall to one old person to one working age person, the old model of uh, right. a pension, a national pension of like three people working and then taxes, the, the numbers don't right. work. Right. So as these kind of like in your face, obvious, um, I didn't fix this, the economics blew up right away, right? Uh, and then trying to restore that balance of things. Um, you know, as the pension systems blow up, then the, the national subsidies realize, oh, I got to pay now in order to, pro you know, to make that later financial thing work out better. Well, there's two ways to pay. Right. One is that you entice foreigners to come and be right. your workers. Right. And the other is to er earlier in time invest in making children. Right. And the problem is, you know, the people who are willing to pay to attract foreigners, they could be grabbing mm -hmm. the young adults from the nations that invested in the kids, but then aren't going to save the retirees because those kid people are going to leave. That's right. why right. they might need to limit immigration. Right, right, right. So that's one of the things we can predict as if, you know, one of the things that would go along with some nations having strong subsidies is that will also have immigration restrictions. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that another thing we'd notice is, I mean, 
the level of taxation and subsidies we're talking about, I think to some people, they'll call that coercion. Right. They're saying you're forcing most of your young women to be mothers and not giving them the freedom to choose a career through mm -hmm. your very high subsidies and taxes. And in right. some sense, that's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, you are really tilting that balance. That is only a small fraction of young women could afford to not be mothers mm -hmm. and choose a career instead because you tax the careers really heavy and subsidize the parenting really high. So um, in terms of um, the numbers on the um, immigration emigration, currently uh, net, you know, on a global world of 8 billion people, uh, net immigration emigration uh, is 4 million. Um, and then uh, total immigration emigration is uh, 10 million. So small, uh, right, small. So 6 million people kind of swap between some countries and then 4 million people uh, net move. Right. And of those 4 million, um, I think um, half or more combined go to uh, the U.S., Australia, and Canada. Um, 1.5 to 2 million. It, it, the U.S. number right. is difficult because of the illegal sure. immigration right. number two. And then um, about a million into, into Europe. So um, the, the numbers are overall small, um, but um, it is some skimming. Can Canada is doing the best at skimming. Um, but then there also is the, the factor which I can go to a more effective national subsidy is, and particularly for companies that are willing to take in people, is I will take in more poor people that are willing to have kids and willing to surrogate my frozen eggs. So China can't, has trouble bribing the Shanghainese women. Seoul has trouble bribing the Seoul sure. women. But they can say, hey, rural woman or, hey, someone from Indonesia come in, you get citizenship, you get all these benefits, you know, the, 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 right. the money that the, the other guy that's turning their nose up at, and then we can use that as a, as a policy to make national subsidy go better. I'm policy. sure that'll help. But again, I just, I, I want to focus on the big problem and the big yeah. effects, and that just yeah. can't be the biggest effect, right? N Most right. of this problem isn't going to be solved by surrogacy. I, 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 I would argue that you could, um, that it could end up being the ultimate solution that um, the, the army of the willing, um, if you do it early enough where you say, okay, I, my shortfall is um, of the 130 million babies in the world, my shortfall to, um, to get to uh, neutral replacement, full replacement is 30 million, right? So, and then by country, you know, 10 million in China, five million, two million in Japan. So if each country does meet that gap, you know, with mass surrogacy, then it can be the full solution. But but it, so, uh, but that would be a side effect of the subsidy. Like with national subsidies, they could be subsidizing the surrogacy. But the, the main effect is the subsidy. Right. Uh, the surrogacy is basically a trade among some people. But when we're yeah. looking at the world as a whole, you know, mm -hmm. the swaps aren't changing the world rate. Right? They're just moving it around. Right. Moving uh, around. The, the right. thing that would be causing the increase would be the subsidy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is how big that could be, but right. that would be. So um, I, I wanted to mention that the, the least likely scenario on my list of 16 mm -hmm. is actually a lot like the national subsidy one, except it's a private solution mm -hmm. whereby, you know, if you just authorized parents to endow their kids with debt and equity, mm -hmm. then you'd have a private solution whereby parents would, you know, seek to create the most valuable kids in the best, most cost-effective manner, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it would probably be more effective and sufficient. Many mm -hmm. people would look at that and call that slavery, but that's kind of what the nation's doing too. Mm -hmm. right. But people apparently don't mind, you know, endowing people with debt at the national level. They mind it at the individual level. So like in the right. U S you know, I think people are, the average child is endowed with, you know, half a million or a million dollars in debt yeah. for all the future U S obligations, but that's okay. But endowing an individual with individual debt, that seems mm -hmm. like a terrible slavery. So unfortunately, right. The slavery framing where it's bad to have individuals in debt but okay mm -hmm. to have nations in debt means mm -hmm. that in fact this national subsidy item number three uh, you know the third highest likely item is more likely than the lowest one because even though the lowest one i've got to argue would in fact be more effective right uh just to un un put a number ballparking the number on the um per child uh surrogacy cost it's about fifty thousand dollars now. 
um, developed countries, you know, United States 100, 200K, but um, you go to Eastern Europe, other places, it's about 50K. So right, but what, the more interesting question is just what's the total parent subsidy that would be required? Right. And right. how much would nations have to pay parents, you know, in total over their parenting time of a child to get right. them to have those kids? That's right. going to be a lot more than 50,000, no doubt. Right. I mean, so so then a million or even more. Right. So it's the question of do we have to pay for the full cost of raising the child, which um, a China number was, uh, say, 600K. Um, and the subsidies that they're trying to give them is about like um, 30 to 40 K. This is RMB. Right. Right. So the um, effectiveness, there is some effectiveness to give them 30, 40 K. So which is 5% of the total cost rate in the child to kind of get them over the hump. Okay. You're, you made the choice and now you're in it. You didn't right. run the numbers, but so then the full right. cost so that's, is. That's yeah. an optimistic account, which is just to say, you know, the main reason for low fertility is like a temporary financing problem. Right, right. And I don't right. believe that really. No, no, because it's not effective enough. It, it only gets 10, 20%. You have to pay 20, 30%, some bigger number than the five. Right. Right. Because it, it's not working. It's not enough. And also yeah. the whole punitive policy thing of like um, uh, wealth transfers from the, the young and below 40 to the old based on capital gains and blah, 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 is... Um, Right now, not only are we not giving them net positive, we are shifting money away in general, globally, to the people who are older because they control right. assets and political stuff. Right. Yeah. So it's worth noticing that, you know, one of the main effects going on here, the reason it changed the other direction wasn't so much a financial thing, it was a cultural thing. Right. That is the culture changed to value careers and leisure over parenting. Right. And so an obvious possibility to suggest is, well, can't we just change culture back? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's worth noticing just how hard that seems to be. It, mm -hmm. it, that we don't have much, much in the way of good lovers there. It, it doesn't, I don't know how you do that exactly. Maybe, maybe it'll just happen indirectly, yeah. but uh, it's mm -hmm. worth noticing how we're, we're stuck with these financial things because that's something we can do. Right, right. Now it may cause a change in culture, so that would be a multiplier effect story. That we, if we have a modest subsidy, then that will have these multiplier effect of the culture will change to value mm -hmm. different things. But mm -hmm. we don't have very much confidence there. So the the biggest thing about changing culture, the the tools, which may not be strong enough, are um, social media propaganda, um, and, and those are the things that at the at national and, and global levels to if you were to um, systematically uh, make an effort to um, uh, engineer the culture, right? Well, then but, so, but who could do that? So, I mean, a key point is we have a global culture now. Right. So if just a few nations like North Korea or something right. try to locally have their own social media campaign to get people to defy global culture, you know, that's more like the insular subculture thing. You know, can right. it work? Once we have this pretty integrated global culture, then it would have to be the global culture to change. But who would be even in a position to pay for or push global cultural changes? So it seems to be um, the alliance of big tech and 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 uh, big government, uh, which it's tr had tried to, which has not been effective uh, for. They they made efforts to do that kind of thing, but it has not been that effective. Although there have been things that have drifted that way in terms of um, certain um, subcultures have gotten more play um, and, and more adherence uh, through um, social media um, increasing their, their popularity and as well as um, um, a certain amount of government stuff. But it's, I, it's I, I would edges. suggest what's going on is mainly the governments just sort of randomly pick things to push Right. And then look, half of those are things that are going to be on the rise and half of them on the fall. Right, <laughs> They're right, going right. to look like failures with respect to the second one and successes with the first, but really yeah. they aren't really succeeding on all any of them because they aren't, they're just randomly pushing things that are, have other causes for rising and falling. Right, right, right. It's, it's not a unified effort. You know, different groups are pushing different things and it ends up being noise. It's, it's, and and it, it's uh, not sufficient to address this issue because it's, it hasn't anywhere. So, so let, let me mention that I did some survey, uh, polls on when people thought the reversal would happen. 
-hmm. and the median date was 2150 mm -hmm. when people thought the you know would verse and that seems to me way too early and I, I think you probably agree that as we're looking at something that could take several centuries if not even a thousand years to reverse and right. in that case you know, we're looking at much more severe problems that pe people might realize. I have um, a more, yes, if if we don't change direction, then 2050 would be optimistic just because I couldn't convince them to have two kids and now I'm trying to convince them to have one kind of thing. It's, it's um, you know, a bad trend. But I think that with, you know, this combination of efforts that, that we must and should hold the line over the next 20, 40 years, like the, the, the big effort. There is no line. Here. Nobody's holding any line. There's nothing there. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's, 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 pro, it's to prevent the, um, I don't see any line. I don't see any effort. I don't see well, anything well, happening. This, this is just a trend that some commenters are noticing, but most people are really quite okay with it in their personal lives. Well, well there are countries, like I said, um, Japan, China, Sweden, you know, there's countries that are, are making substantial efforts to it, not um, solving it yet. Right, but, but substantial, but not not enough, like not enough, not enough not maybe enough. by an order of magnitude. Right, right, right. Um, so the yeah, question so, is, will anybody get a lot more concerned and do a lot more than whatever they're doing now? Which, which is what, um, you know, my effort would be to, you know, like the, for the people, you know, like Elon Musk, powerful, influential people who see this as a problem to get it to the priority, to the level of effort that would be needed, you know, to say, you know, they just like um, for climate change, people scope out the problem, say, okay, here's how big it is. And then here's what we have to do. And then to get um, the, you know, to raise something to, okay, this is, you know, really serious. And here's what we got to do to do it. And then whether you strive towards it, at least, you know, so um, at least we don't go down like a boiled frog, Right. That if, if it does, if we can't solve it, at least we put in all the effort that we're fully conscious and aware of. Here's how we're screwing ourselves. I think I'm I guess I'm more skeptical than you that about the whole policy world and its influence on the world. <laughs> that, right, right. You know, there's a whole world of serious people who discuss serious problems with each other and have you know conferences and meetings and write papers about it. And I just think in general that doesn't have that much effect on the world. All those people and all the things they do mm -hmm. uh, and that's playing out here. Right, um, right. I, I wanted to notice that um, there's a couple of things on this scenario, which are basically AI driven scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, robot nannies and last career. So last yep. career is a scenario that gets a 35 rating of likelihood out of hundred. Mm -hmm. And that's where like being a parent is one of the last careers available because all the other jobs have been taken. And yep. robot nanny, nannies is kind of the opposite. Well, we can do other things, but we find a way to make robots do the nanny, the parenting job. Mm -hmm. Right. And that that's even 21 down on the list. And Age of M, you know, my book, Brain Emulations, is even farther down. So mm -hmm. uh, even though most of my followers are pretty optimistic about AI in the near term, mm -hmm. when they look at this long term issue of fertility, they're not thinking of those scenarios as the main scenarios in play, which is striking to me. Um, so I, I think that the... Um... The change to um, a lot of robotization, um, human and robots, that scenario, I'm hopeful, can play out over the next um, 15, 20 years. If, so, if it does, of course, then that would make a huge difference to the fertility problem. But right. I mean, I'm just pointing out most of these respondents in this poll don't think so. Right, right. Um, just uh, and my case for that would be that um, the Tesla bot and then there's also sanctuary AI, that the humanoid robot economics are very powerful. And if you have self-driving, that that um, can make it happen pretty quickly. The economics of, of them putting it into their factories and then change, you know, the right. gig of Mexico being adapted to it could, you know, have this burst upon the scene. I have okay. uh, some- I mean, as we both know for 70 years, a lot of people have been saying it's close. It's gonna have a big impact soon. And right. so I don't necessarily see the current mode being that different from all of the last 70 years in terms of some people are hoping the robots are coming soon, but yeah, we're not right. seeing concrete evidence of it. We're just seeing all the usual hopes. Right, right, right. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to revisit that in a few years if, if this starts uh, adjusting. Um, 
I have some detailed scenarios where, and more uh, on a financial model basis, not just um, on a tech basis. Um, but then the, the other te te uh, technological rabbit would be to have some level of um, anti-aging that affects fertility time. So as we know, the, the crude right, So that's my old mom scenario here listed. Old mom's, old mom's scenario. Listed right. uh, number, about halfway down the list. It's got a likeliness of 31 out of 100 here. Right. And right. a desirability of 33. Mm -hmm. So, right. so yeah, that scenario is that we extend the duration of fertility for women and also the duration of youthful energy mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, after an initial career effort, switch to having parents for a while, uh, kids for a while, and then maybe switch back to career and back and forth several times, ideally. But right. as we know, lifespans have not actually, you know, dramatically increased lately. That is, mortality has fallen at a pretty steady rate for the entire last century. And right, in fact, right. recent trends are, are down because of drug deaths. Mm -hmm. right. And so, uh, again, that's one of these perennial hopes mm -hmm. that's around for a long time, but, you know, we haven't seen it yet. And... Which which goes to the, the the technology that does exist, admittedly only at one million per year and two hundred thousand per year, which is the IVF frozen egg thing, where basically you square the curve of fertility loss and, and enable right. people up to age forty five and even fifty. So in the U.S., it's pretty expensive. Uh, hopefully, those prices could be lowered. Right. Uh, but again, I think the biggest obstacle there is youthful energy <laughs> later right. in life. That is. A lot of 40, even if 40 year olds could have kids, I think most of them, 40 year old women at that point, they're pretty used to being in a career mm -hmm. and they realize how physically demanding having kids are, raising kids are. Right. And so that puts most of them off. So right. I, I feel like just the frozen eggs by itself isn't enough. Yeah. Yes. Not enough. You again need to have um, a certain amount of um, automation, a certain amount of health improvement, a certain amount of. Uh, service change in order to right. and I'm, make I'm not work. and I'm not really very optimistic about robot nannies. But I mean, if I look at all the standard criteria by which jobs are more or less automatable, yeah. and I look at my granddaughter and what mm -hmm. my son and his wife are doing to take care of it, I look at that and I go, "This is not close to automatable." Right, right. <laughs> this, Al you know. Although, although culturally um, in Asia, they have many human nannies, and but unfortunately, it doesn't. Haven't you know? Uh, Southeast Asia has some of the worst um, fertility rates around, in spite of the fact that they have human nannies. So it's um, it's right now the the second lowest, likely on my list of scenarios, is one that more directly addresses this, which is what I called parenting factories. Mm -hmm. That is, if if we raised kids in in large scale boarding school orphanages, sort of things, mm -hmm. where we just made it very regimented. We probably mm -hmm. could bring the costs way down of mm -hmm. raising kids, but of course, then parents would have much less direct personal interaction with their children, and children's lives would be much more constrained. Mm -hmm. And clearly, people, <laughs> this is uh, rated the most dramatic story, mm -hmm. and also the second or the third lowest uh, uh, appealing scenario here. People <laughs> would would find it a very interesting story, but they would hate it basically to have all these kids raised in these factories uh, because. They people really value the personal, expensive, high touch parenting styles that we have. I, I would say if we uh, relabel that from parenting factories to um, community child raising, where basically you you have um, you know um, a larger extended uh, network of family and friends, you know. Like people have now right. where they have grandparents. But, but the, the question is, can you make it cheaper? Not just can you have more people involved? Right, right, so, right. So, right. you know, right. when we look at other community things, they aren't usually cheaper. Right, right. You know, community food, community car washes, like community libraries. We, we've got a whole world of community things in our world. that They typically let people interact more with their community and feel more involved and get more meaning in their lives. But they're not usually cheaper. Right, right, right. So, so then if we have... Um, um, robotic automation of work or other things which redu can reduce the work week in theory, then if we... Um, so that's more my last career scenario. Right. Where where people have so less, uh, so little else meaningful to do that parenting becomes one of the last meaningful jobs that they're willing to take on. Right, right. 
And, and so, yeah, so that goes to somehow um, reorganizing and, and subsidizing that aspect of um, of society to say, okay, let's um, uh, enable, get the time for, for that activity. You know, we have um, made the time for uh, four year, six year degrees or other uh, things in life that did not exist a hundred years ago. You know, like the, the, the uh, amount of schooling has increased from, yeah, I think, I think the first uh, grade school, high schools didn't emerge till like 200 years ago, right? And then the, the universities were um, a rare thing. They existed, but they were very rare and didn't so, become a major aspect. So in terms of desirability, yeah. the number five item on my list is also near the bottom of likelihood called the gap decade. Right. So at least I think I've heard some people find this intriguing. Mm -hmm. It would be the idea that we it might be less than a decade, but that we basically take people at a certain young age, like 16 or 18, and we say, you're not allowed to train for careers or do careers right now for a while. Right. <laughs> you're going to force a gap on you. The thing you're allowed to do now is have kids. Right, right. And maybe you even, even make it possible for people to say, have triplets all at once and then raise three kids together. Right. And then, you know, a decade later, they, they're they allowed to go back into their career prep and career activity. That would be a pretty dramatic scenario. It's a very expensive thing to do, but it would solve the sort of status competition problem of young women wanting to show prove themselves in a career and being less willing to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, be a parent as well. We're just going to force all young people <laughs> And we're probably going to get worse career training. I mean, probably people at 16, 18 to 28, or they are probably at a peak of ability to learn new careers. So mm -hmm. if you don't let them get back to later in life, they probably are going to be worse at learning the careers. But it's still a thing people seem to like this scenario, at least. Number five on the list, as I said. Right. So I, I, like that, like I like that scenario. It's also, in terms of the uh, acceptability of it, uh, other well, there's countries who say, okay, you must have two years of military service, right? right? So that so it's, there are societies organized around that, and then there are um, in France and other places, you know, sabbaticals and where people take off, you know, four months at a time every five years. There's ways to organize these um, gap things. Also, extending the, um, you know some more generous countries, a year of uh, parental leave or other things like that. So the, the uh, gap decade, or at least a gap, you know, three to six years seems not infeasible. That, um, that, uh, but it would be a large cultural change. So, right. I mean, mechanically it could work, right. but getting a support for it is, I mean, basically you need most of society to go along with it. Otherwise, you know, people who want to show, you know, succeed in the careers and beat the other ones are just going to like go outside of the system wherever they can. Right. So right. <laughs> like say if Europe did this and the U S didn't, right. Well, a lot of Europeans would just come to the U S so they could right. pursue their careers instead of being forced to take the gap in Europe. Right. Well, well the most effective point to do it would be around uh, college age. So currently right. we're saying, okay, four years for college. And then um, by, by extending that, we're already giving you that time. So then people are taking long, longer to get their careers going anyway. So then if we say- Right, but the college is part of their career preparation. Right. So that's why they go to college instead of having kids is that they don't want to lose out on the career path. They figure that if they don't go to college, they aren't going to be considered for the desirable careers at all. And so right. that's the problem. That is you need to prevent people from going to college and careers in mm -hmm. order to make the gap thing work. Mm -hmm. The whole point is the thing that's keeping people not having kids is that- you know, the career path says you have to put in full time on the career path and no excuses, no gaps. Right, right. So so then the the, the structure and the, and the policy needs to support the payment for it and blend in that, you know, as you do this thing, as you do the gap, that we're going to ensure, tilt the system to give you that career jumpstart at, at, the, at the end of this period. But coordinating to... career tilts is also very hard, as we know. Right. We got a lot of you know dispute about attempts and the effectiveness of that in the U.S. at the moment, at least. Right. Right. So, so um, having that being part of the solution, um, and and to an experiment with it to to say let's give it some tries, see how to make it work, um, 
it's certainly worthwhile, you know, a, a state, some county, the other things right. to, to increase that. Um, and to, you know, start with, you know, year two or something like that. Uh, so we, we only have that a few minutes left. Sure. I think it might be worth just going over a little more detail, just how bad it's going to be before we solve the problem. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Because we've been talking about all these solutions that might take centuries. Right. And I think we want to make vivid to people why we think it's bad. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so in the, if you look at the literature on this, they, they talk about how there's this ratio of retirees to, you know, workers in terms of retirement benefits. Mm -hmm. They talk about how innovation is less when more people are older, young people are more innovative. Mm -hmm. There's issues of, you know, uh, you know, stranded capital where there'll be these big cities with all this infrastructure that can't be supported because there aren't enough people there. Yeah. And those are all going to be real problems. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think people quite realize that you're used to a world of innovation where things are just improving over time. Mm -hmm. And once the economy peaks, then one, yeah. you know, when the economy is half as big as it was at the peak, it'll have half the innovation rate. Right. And when it's one tenth the peak, it'll have one tenth the innovation rate. And right. that won't take very long for basically innovation to shut off. Right. And in addition, people don't realize just how many scale economies our economy relies on. Right. That is, we have like large shipping industries and large manufacturing industries, et cetera, chip manufacturers, all based on a certain scale of the world economy. Right. And as the world economy shrinks, those things are going to have to shrink in scale and we won't get the scale economies. Right. We maybe not make new chip factories every once, you know, as often, or even not, a, we may stop just ever making a new chip factory, or maybe, you know, shipping containers won't work because ports are too big and we can't afford the large scale cost of huge ports, et cetera. I mean, we're going to face a whole bunch of problems like that. And once the world gets used to not innovating, mm -hmm. most people don't like change anyway. We've had to have a lot of cultural pressures to get ordinary people to accept the level mm -hmm. of changes that we have. Once mm -hmm. change goes away and people get used to not changing, they're not going to be that easy to get back into a changing mode later when right. even if the economy starts to grow. Mm -hmm. And some of these solutions have pretty bad side effects, like the insular subculture that insular subculture, in order to motivate people to stay away from the larger culture, it's going to have to tell those people a lot of bad things about the rest of us. Right. And it's going to tie those to things in our culture and technology, et cetera. And it's just going to reject a bunch of those things as mm -hmm. the legitimation of why they should be insular and separated. They're going to say mm -hmm. all, a lot of polluting, terrible things out there you should stay away from. And so they're going to throw away a lot of stuff that we've spent a lot of time developing as their excuse for being insular. So that'll be a big cost. And even the DNA replacement, I mean, the sort of people who will resist social pressure and you know not care about social status and just want to have kids, there could be a lot of negative things about those people we won't like. Right. And so I think that's the important thing. To, if you go down the, all of this list, each of them has some pretty big negative side effects. Mm -hmm. right. And the important thing is realize we're going to have to pick one of them. Right. So, so yeah, so I, I've um, gone over exactly how bad things are. And we see that with Japan. Japan, 1995, had a peak of $5.5 trillion in their economy. Their economy is now $4.4 trillion in, in nominal terms. So 20% you know, decline. A 20% decline. But they should have at least doubled. Any other country that kind of had anything close to normal, um, a developed country that had any close to normal demographics, went from, you know, 100 in 1995 to 200. Other countries like the United States went to 300, you know, in terms of a triple of right. the economy. And Japan went the other way down negative 20%. So it's not just the, the people, it was because they went from 38 uh, average age to 48, that they, over those uh, 20 some years, 28 years, they, their age increased, which on the spending curve, and I have that uh, quickly here, let me just... Um, show that in a second um i have uh, spending curve here it is so so basically as you go from like 38 to 40 the the spending i already bought my house and i stopped buying houses and stuff like that and so then my spending you know starts starts dropping so that spending curve hit is what um and see that most of the big economies have this have this number two number three have the below replacement by a lot, you know, one point, you know, near the one level. Um, and, and so the overall economies of the world, 
you know, are going to be hit really badly with this thing that's already hit Japan and it's going to get worse for Japan. So, and then the, the age for China goes from average age 38 to 50 by 2050. So they're going to have a worse move in terms of average age because of their um, one child policy, demographics, population pyramid thing. Then Japan did from like 1995 to 2023. The 2023 to 2050 period for Japan, China, South Korea is going to be worse. And those countries represent, you know, 40 trillion. So Japan should have gone from 5 trillion to 10 trillion and did not. Now, China is at 19 trillion, should go to 40 and maybe won't. Maybe if they do the same thing, they drop to 15 trillion. So then this negative 25 trillion taken out. And then also other countries, Europe, et cetera, will, will have this big hit. So the... And then also China, 30% of their GDP is real estate. So if they also have this supply demand problem of a lot less um, demand for real estate, they could lose 15% off the top from the real estate market going in half like it has in Japan. So Right. So to an individual person, they might think, okay, you know, incomes, you know, GDP goes down, but population goes down too. So, you know, consumption per person stays stable. We're getting old, we're comfortable. Not such a bad scenario yeah. right? from an individual point of view. And the main thing we're missing is the, the vision and the potential we have being lost. That right. is humanity stops growing, <laughs> stops advancing, stops developing. And just for several centuries, maybe stays in a stasis from which it may be hard to get out of. But Japan got poorer per person. Japan yeah. got poorer per but person. But not enormously, but, you know. But the thing is, they should have doubled, and then they went flat negative. So because of the fact that people were spending less. So I spend less, so that means the whole market, my local national market, uh, sure. shrank. So then, so it, it does have this hit. And also the thing of, like, no retirement. I got to work till I drop because no one can pay me to not work. So, so the individual hit is not insignificant right so but but the change is large enough that many people will go you know modest hurt versus very huge risky change and they go i don't want to do a huge risky change i'll just take the modest hurt and that's you know the most likely scenario for not solving the problem is that people go especially i mean old people are less willing to take chances to like make new big things to solve problems right? and the world's getting right. old so you know, there'll be this matching of the temperament of most people to their resigned, declining situation. Each person is resigned and declining, and the world is resigned and declining, and that could go on for a long time. Yeah, and so then that goes to that we're not in a better uh, position to solve it 20 years, 30 years down the road. That that goes to max effort now, because right. if you're, you know, down, and and the other thing is that if things blow up financially, you know, like the, the Silicon Valley bank blew up, Repu first public bank right. blew up, but the, you know, 10 of the top 20 banks are in these countries, you know, China, Japan. Right. right. So in addition to a slow, sad decline, we could have some big disasters that right. speed the decline wars and collapses of all sorts could, could happen along this path. So right. this is sort of the, the best version of this past is a slow, steady decline. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you're basically eating, negative 2% GDP growth for decades every year, then that is a fragile situation that can blow up even worse. So oh, my good year is like Japan, my good year is even my bad year is negative 3%, negative 5%, something like that, right? Or I, I hit a negative 10, right? So that, um, and then the ability to endure the shocks get, gets, gets worse and worse. Right. So, so that, um, so I'm concerned about, um, um, financial crisis um, within the next right. 20, 30 years. I mean, the world's gotten peaceful and placated over the last century. And some people say it's in part because of growth. That is, mm -hmm. we're all in a higher mood with growth. As things get better, and not, we're not as envious of each other or resentful of each other or eager to go grab stuff from each other when everybody's doing better. But mm -hmm. conversely, as everybody slowly does worse, right. the lower mood might cause more conflicts. Right, right, right. The, the whole... Um, if you're um, going from the po the positive spiral into the downward spiral, it's incredibly different in terms of like the economics, in terms of how people feel and react and stuff like that. That once you're going down, 
you know, turning that around is, is really, really hard. And, and the, so. Right. So yeah, I thought we actually know some people, like if you're working in a company that's growing and booming, uh, but things just are much more optimistic there and energetic and people are nicer to each other and a company yeah. that's shrinking, going down, right. I'll bet there's just a lot more conflict going on. Right, right. There's all that empire building, defending my empire, all right. the dynamics of I must hold my piece of a shrinking pie. And then and the viciousness that people do that. If if, if everyone has more pie, everyone's happy, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I said shrinking pie, um, the you know, the whole um like um on an uh, a plane crash island, the eating people kind of thing. You yeah, know. No, now I hear that doesn't actually happen. So we have to be fair. Okay. The literature on people and actual disasters says that it's not very much like the disaster movies. In disaster movies and disasters, everybody is mean. But in fact, in real disasters, people are pretty nice and pretty helpful. So okay. Okay. But that's different than like decades of decline. How right, does that right. weigh on you? Just showing up at a disaster that started a few hours ago, people seem to like be pretty helpful and nice. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But then the, the long-term psychology of... of uh... Of, uh, yeah, like in Japan right now, you see they've had four, you know, three decades right. of decline. So how did how did that? What's their you know? mood? What's their right. you know, eagerness to try new things? How much are they sniping at each other? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see this. Hopefully, we can be the optimistic scenarios work out. Um, okay. I definitely. So I've got a recording error. It says a storage space thing, but I'm okay. As soon as you end, I'm going to leave this window open as long as it can, so it can like do whatever Save it needs it up. to do. Okay. Okay. Great talking to you, Robin. Okay. I hope to talk again. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.